So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present some of the research done in my department, my lab, uh, to this August uh, uh, audience. Um, I also want to say this is a little bit challenging for me because uh, normally my talks are about an hour and a half and designed specifically so that less than 30% of the audience understands what I'm saying. That's the only way to stay funded. Uh, but but, uh, but I, uh, so I, I decided to take up the challenge that, was, uh, that Anil gave me. So I, I want to start by demystifying this idea of big data, right? So this is the SETI tells us the, the search for extraterrestrial life telescope in Australia. You can look at the Hadron Super Collider. Those, those projects generate exabytes. That's a billion, billion bytes of information every week. All the data that cancer biologists have generated is probably a few petabytes. Uh, and in fact, the problem with this data is not that it's big. In fact, I would say that biological challenges are medium-sized uh, in terms of where they stand on the longitudinal scale. Um, but it actually doesn't fit anymore in an Excel spreadsheet. And that's been really challenging for biologists that used to be able to analyze their data uh, in person. And so, um, and so the other big problem is that this data is not big, but it's extraordinarily complex. And I think Cordana did a great job. Why is it complex? It's complex because it's generated by molecular interaction networks inside cells, which are actually different from cell type to cell type, um, that have been honed by 3.7 billion years of evolution. Um, and so uh, it made it even more complex in cancer because in cancer you actually have uh, the additional problem that mutations that have never been seen by evolution in that particular configuration of patterns are now dysregulating these networks. And so, uh, and so I wanted to give you a sense of why, for instance, we have sort of abandoned a little bit the roadmap of, of going after mutation because think of a poker game. So in po poker game you get five cards Every single hand is different, and in fact, you know, you can have all sorts of different hands. And if you actually do the math, um, you will find that with a deck of 52 cards, you can actually get 2.6 million, approximately, uh, different hands, all right? So now turn that deck of cards, of 52 cards, into a deck of 2,000 cancer genes. This is about the number of genes that have been essentially have small or big effect on cancer. And now remove the limit of having only five cards. You could have three cards, you could have 100 cards. Uh, so that number of possible mutational patterns you can get is now larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So I don't know how many of you know how many atoms are in the universe. It's actually 10 to the 80. So 10 to the 80 is a big number. It means one followed by 80 zeros, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a challenging number, but you, when you actually ask how many patterns you could form from this 2,000 cancer gene, that number is actually 10 to the 400, and that's one followed by 400 zeros, okay? So the, the reality is that there are not enough atoms in the universe to even give us, to let us observe the potential patterns that could give us cancer. And that's why I've always thought that using the mutation in the cancer genome to actually understand what particular type of therapy could be used works in certain particular cases, but it's essentially the tip of the iceberg of how these cells are dysregulated. So how do we address this complexity in a way, you know, sort of at some point you have to decide, you know, how, how am I gonna make the problem go away? Either I have, you know, an amazing artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning system that will actually make sense out of 10 to the 400 possible options, and I don't even know that we could actually staff clinical trials because the, you know, every cell in the actual cancer mass of the one patient has a different range of mutations and therefore in many cases different uh, uh, sensitivity to different drugs. So how are we going to address this problem? So I'm a physicist by training and so physicists don't like to use black boxes where there's an input and an output and try to build statistical association. What they like to do is to open the box, look inside and try to figure out how things work. And so the way things work in, in biology is actually very complicated. It's complicated because I'm just giving you an example of one particular protein called Nanog. This is one of the Yamanaka factors uh, that we study in pluripotency. These are the targets that that particular protein regulates in just a particular type of cell, which is a, a, a pluripotent stem cell. Uh, and as you can see, some of the targets are actually activated by, by Nanog. You know, they turn slightly red. Some of the targets are repressed by Nanog. Um, and this, of course, will be very different from the way Nanog would work in a, say, glioma or would work in a, in a blood cancer. So we need to generate these models for every single tissue context in which we want to apply our methodologies. 
But once you build these networks, which we can now do extremely effectively, so many people think that I'm a computational biologist, I'm actually not. So half of my lab is experimental, half of my lab is computational because you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And, and so we basically validate these predictions. We go to the lab and we've shown in maybe more than 100 papers at this point that about 70 to 80 percent of the interaction that we predict using information theory are actually experimentally validated. And so this gives us a great lens because now imagine this single protein now becomes 2,500 transcriptional regulators and maybe 6,500 protein, including signal, signal transduction protein, et cetera. So the, 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 the kind of interaction network that you would get, which will have a million to uh, two million interactions, would look like a fuzzy ball. In fact, I've been credited with coming up with the term ridiculum to describe them. Um, and, and, and it's really impossible to glean any, uh, any knowledge from these networks by looking at them. But when you put them inside a computer, these are actually tailor-made for a supercomputer to make decisions. What kind of decision can we make? For instance, we can ask the question, what are the proteins that induce a particular state of the cell that I'm observing right now? And I know that if all these genes that are positively regulated by NANOG are activated and all the ones that are repressed are, are underexpressed, I know that NANOG has got to have something to do with it. And so this allows us to really find uh, ways to think about how the normal cell works. And, uh, and in this case, you can see there are, there are, there are actually proteins called uh, receptors that, see, uh, that sit on the, on the membrane of the proteins that are proteins called signaling proteins that are in the, between the, 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 the membrane and, and the nucleus. And then there are these proteins in the nucleus whose role is to actually regulate the genetics, the, the expression of genes. Um, and so that's why I, I call the genome, we talk a lot about genes, but what are genes? These genes don't do anything. Uh, genes that sit very prettily in the, in the genome and, and are, are not very much involved in, in functions until they're actually transcribed into, uh, into an mRNA molecule and, 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 then, uh, and then synthesizing a protein. And so we, we call the genome essentially the book of what could be, and we call the proteome or the transcriptome the book of what is, because the genome is essentially a set of ingredients, and until those ingredients are sitting in the fridge, you're not going to have a recipe, you're not going to eat a dinner tonight. You need a chef to do that, and the chefs in the cell are these protein called transcription factors and cofactors that essentially regulate uh, the expression of, of the good genes uh, that actually allow the cell to perform its function and repress the function of, of the bad genes that would turn it, for instance, into a cancer cell. Okay? So, so this is very important because every cell has a different program. And in fact, the reason we have 20,000 genes and maybe a million protein isoform is not because they're needed for the cell to, to implement this program. It's because you want to prevent the cell from switching its state, for instance, from becoming from a, from a, glial, a glial cell to become a, a, a blood cell. Um, and so this is called, uh, it's called homeostasis. It's basically maintaining the st state and function of the cell. So what happens in cancer? In cancer, what happens is that you start accumulating mutation, typically because you lose a tumor suppressors. And so the mutation are now these little explosions that you see here. And what they do, they dysregulate the function of these transcription factors and cofactors and essentially create a completely abnormal program of regulation of the cell. It's a program that it's never been seen in the context of a physiologic cell, and it ends up creating modules of transcription factor working together and regulating each other that are not physiologic. These are modules that are never seen in a normal cell, right? And the problem with this module is that now they activate all the bad programs and they inhibit all the good programs. For instance, they tell the cell to proliferate in an uncontrolled fashion. They tell the cell to stop responding to program death si a, a, a signal. They, they, talk, they, they tell the cell how to attract populations that will abrogate the, the ability of the immune system to, to detect it. And so these are the proteins that we have actually focused on. And, and why is this important? It's important because what we have shown in many papers, one came up in Cell last year, and you know, but there's probably dozens of papers uh, that we have published on this argument, that in fact, these are the proteins that are responsible for integrating the effect of the genetics in their upstream model. And so what happens is that what these proteins do, they take these 10 to the 400 possible combination of mutation, and they turn them into a very, very small number of actual states that the cancer cell can occupy. So for instance, we have observed 112 different states when we looked at more than 15,000 uh, uh, 15, individual tumors in TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. When we go inside individual tumors, for instance, a glioma or a pancreatic cancer, et cetera, and we look at single cells, 
we've been able to identify anywhere between two and 11 different states, but never more than that. And so this is a very, very small number. So this is a little bit like a pachinko game, right? In a pachinko game, you have these balls that actually fall down, and because they have all these different pins, they can follow billions of different trajectories. Imagine each one of these trajectories being one particular mutational pattern that you may have. So, however, at the end of the, of the game, the ball falls inside one of a very few slots, okay? And there's the silver lining. The silver lining is that, yes, the complexity of cancer is extraordinary, but what is possible is actually to figure out that many of these different mutational patterns, for instance, in triple negative breast cancer, almost no two patients have the same mutational pattern, and certainly no two cells inside a tumor have the same mutational patterns. This patient will actually follow into cancer states that are virtually indistinguishable. Okay, they may be different, there may be multiple states in the same tumor, but the states is from a very small repertoire. And so what we've decided to do is to focus on the proteins that maintain these very few states. And I said, you know, we, we were able to discover only 24 modules that are responsible for virtually all tumor types. Um, and we've shown that when you abrogate the activity of these modules, these tumor cells die. Why do they die? Because you're basically, it's like pulling the rag under the feet of someone who's standing up they rely on these proteins to maintain the tumor cell state. You now remove it, the cell has to reprogram into a different state. And in fact, many of the things that we've done in collaboration with many people here at Columbia, for instance, is to show that we can use the same approaches in normal cell physiology to reprogram cells from any state we have to any state we want, okay? And so what we, this leads to is that essentially we can focus on these proteins in these modules that we call tumor checkpoints, um, of which there's a relatively small number, as I said, and we can identify drugs by doing large-scale perturbational assays that will actually abrogate the activity, not of just one target, but of the entire module. They literally, they work as an on-off switch. And it's, when it's on, it's bad, or sometimes when it's off, it's bad. And you can literally invert the activity of all these proteins leading to the demise of the cancer cell. And so uh, this is, uh, this is you know, intriguing as a concept. We now validate it, but I wanted to show why, you know, in the, the previous talk, we talked about artificial intelligence. Why is this different from AI? In AI and in machine learning, you use training sets. You use, for instance, you want to know how much time it takes a car to go from here to Boston. What you would do, you would start observing millions of cars moving everywhere. So you use your Tesla uh, applications, and now you would measure how much time it gets uh, a car that goes a certain speed, a different speed. And, and now your model builds a regression model and can tell you exactly how much time it will take. Okay. But what if you know the laws of motion, of motion of Newton? You don't need to observe anything. You don't need a training set. You can start from first principles. And that's exactly what we do. Our first principle are, in fact, the regulatory and signaling and microRNA interaction and protein-protein interaction networks that we use. And these models give a very precise equation that are now so predictive that when we go to the lab to validate, for instance, whether a particular drug will kill a particular subpopulation of a tumor, we get it right about 80% of the time. Okay, so this is, this is quite remarkable. Um, and I wanna say cancer is much more complex than this, of course, because it's not just a cancer cell. And, and, and you know, cancer is a puzzle, and I think uh, Gordana did a fantastic job in explaining the complexity, not just of the tumor, which is in itself a mixture of multiple states, but in fact of the tumor microenvironment, which are the cells that the tumor attracts, uh, because this requires understanding how, for instance, the tumors may secrete cytokine that can attract a you know, mildly suppressive population that can just block the immune system from seeing it. So creating sort of a cape of invisibility. And so we have to recognize that this complex pattern cannot be recognized by looking at one individual tassel or piece. It really needs to look at the entire structure, very much like what we do in this cancer center is not what the individual investigator does, although many of us do uh, interesting things, but when we put them together in a collegial and, 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 and really a, a multidisciplinary uh, interactive group of researchers, you know, collaboration that lead to completely novel discoveries can emerge. And I want to end with saying that, you know, this is, um, this sounds like a lot of blah, blah, blah. Uh, how, is this, uh, how is this affecting the life of patients? It's actually, there are really good moments. There are good moments where we have two children, the only two children that were treated with drugs uh, that were predicted by this methodology, a memorial. Uh, and uh, we uh, basically predicted drugs that they would have never been given to these patients. They were untreatable by conventional uh, 
uh, approaches. They are now, both of them after two years, one has no sign of cancer, the other one has a dramatic reduction. It is one of the rarest tumor uh, calcifying as a stromal epithelial tumor. Uh, there's probably 40 cases reported in the literature. They have absolutely no idea what to do. And now, just uh, very serendipitously this morning, uh, Nature Cancer just accepted a paper uh, where we reported our very first clinical trial that is completed. We have two of them. Both of them has had one, have had 100% validation of the predictions of the specific targets that one should hit uh, and the specific drugs with which to hit them. And so um, I would like to stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention for sitting through this.